uh, to James, if that's, if you're okay, James, you ready for I'm us? fine, if that's, go if for it. You're Great. okay, yes. Okay, right. Um, the talk tonight is called Mull and Iona, A Geological Journey, and basically just going to go around Mull and Iona and the other islands and look at interesting geology. There's nothing too technical, well, hopefully not too technical, it's all fairly straightforward and lots of pretty pictures to look at uh, of what I think are the really the top geological attractions in these islands. Um, just got, I'm just going to say before I start that I've got a bit of a cold and I've been coughing and spluttering so if you hear that in the middle then you know, just ignore it it's just me as having a moment. Um, okay I think we'll, we'll just get going. Maldona, a geological journey. Okay, so the topics for tonight are how Mull fits in with the rest of Scotland, UK, the major tectonic units, the geology map of Mull, a brief description of the oldest to the youngest rocks. There's a great variety of scenery and I've got lots of photographs to illustrate that. And we're going to start at Iona and go on a long geo trip around the islands. First of all, I want to show you some resources that I've used. I mean, some of the stuff that you will see tonight is from these books. The, um, for basic information about Mull and Iona and these islands, this one, Mull and Iona, a landscape fashioned by geology by SNH, is a great little book. The illustrations in it are fantastic, and I'll be using some of them tonight. Uh, it's been replaced by this one, Mull and Iona, and American Landscapes in Stone which is sort of similar, but it covers a bit more territory. Um, there's also Mull in the Making by Ross Jones. Now, this has been out for quite some time, and it's still a good little book. Um, well worth uh, having a look at if, you're, if you want a, you know, a basic, but still fairly comprehensive uh, look at the geology. If you're into the more serious stuff, the really, really serious stuff, then the Paleogene Volcanic Districts by Emilius and Bell. This is an absolute belter of a book. Thoroughly recommend this if you're really serious about your geology and you really want to get into the detail. This is nice and up to date and um, it's got some great stuff in it. The uh, other book that I've got here is the Tertiary Igneous Geology of the Isle of Mull. Now, this was the Geologist Association excursion guide. Now, at the moment, this is still really the only excursion guide to the geology of Mull and it was published in 1969. So it's way out of date, it's pretty limited but there's, uh, there's some good stuff in it. Um, the other stuff, of course, that you would want to look at is the much more technical stuff like the, the memoir of the Geological Survey and various uh, papers that have been published by various academics over the years, and there's been a lot done on Mull. But to get started, if you want to look at the geology of Mull, these are what I would kick off with. Okay, so this is Mull from space. We're, uh, we're going to start down in Iona, down the bottom left here. And we'll just take a trip all the way around the coast and have a look at various bits and bobs. So, uh, yep, that's Mull from space. Um, I mentioned the, the major tectonic units and how Mull fits in with this. Well, you've got the you've got the Southern Uplands Fault, you've got the Highland Boundary Fault, you've got the Great Glen Fault, and you've got the famous Moyne Thrust coming down here. Mull sits in between, basically, the Moyne Thrust and the a Great Glen Fault. The Great Glen Fault actually runs through the very southeast of Mull. And that's why Loch, Loch Bui, Loch Usk, and Loch Spelvey are all sort of in a line, because there's a fault runs through there, a line of weakness. And that's, that's why you've got these locks running there. So the, the, south, the very southeast bit of Mull is actually effectively part of the Central Highlands, and most of Mull is part of the Northern Highlands. But I uh, won't, won't bother too much with this. It's part, Mull is part of the British Paleogene Volcanic Districts, and these are basically igneous centres up and down the west coast, which were active about 60 million years ago. You've got Skye, Mull, Ardemurkin, Rum, Small Isles. You've got places like Northern Ireland, Antrim. You've got, uh, what do you call it, Arran. There's other stuff as well, like St Kilda, and even Rockall, and as far south as islands like Lundy and the Bristol Channel. So 60 million years ago, this was all very active, all very uh, explosive and 
uh, tectonically, you know, doing its stuff. Um, it, uh, the, the volcanic activity didn't really last for that long, about like three million years perhaps in the case of Mull. And um, but since then it's been pretty quiet. This is the geological map of Mull that everyone likes and has lots of people have got this framed and on the wall because it looks so impressive. It looks pretty complicated and it is. Um, the work that the officers of the geological survey did was quite in incredible to get all this detail down. But rather than concentrate on this map, we'll look at another one. And this one here, this is a simplified map that's in that SNH book that I mentioned. And to just give you a wee brief overview of what's on here, this green stuff is mainly lava flows, okay? All this green stuff you see around here. This bit in the middle is all the complicated stuff that we're not going to talk about too much. Around the edges, you'll find there's yellow and orange and stuff like this. That is the underlying older rocks that peep out near the edge. And down in the Ross of Mull, you've got the Ross of Mull granite, this big red thing here, and you've got Iona over here. Now, Iona is much, much older than the rest of Mull. Um, the Ross of Mull granite, this red stuff, actually stretches offshore for quite a way. So it covers a bigger area than you actually see. So that, that's, that's, the major, that's the major stuff. I mean, it's actually fairly straightforward if you ignore this bit in the middle. Uh, here we've got the, the various ages of the rocks and what you'll find. I, mean, I don't want to dwell too much on this. This um, uh, shows you that the, the vast majority of Mull is in about here, Paleogene. It's about, like I said, it's about 60 million years old. The vast majority of the rock is all this igneous stuff that you see here. But you do find some of the older stuff underneath. This is a cross section which explains most of the geology quite well. The, most of the basement rocks are these tightly twisted and contorted and folded uh, rocks, metamorphic rocks of Moyne age. So these things are, you know, we'll, we'll see these later in some of the pictures, um, quite contort, uh, altered. On top of these, you've got rocks of what are called Mesozoic era, which are like middle age rocks, if you like. So this is the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous uh, strata that you'll find here. And this is the sort of stuff that you'll see at Grieben and at uh, Karsig and places like that. And then over the top, you've got all this volcanic stuff that's been dumped, that's poured out of volcanoes and uh, fissure systems. Um, so that's, that's basically the, the story for Mull. There's, there's really three layers, if you like, that make up most of the island. So we'll start in Iona and have a look and see what we can find. It's very different from Mull, some of the oldest rocks in Britain. The geology is highly complex. I mean, it's, it's mind-numbingly complex, in fact. Most of it is Lewisian gneiss, although there are some rocks on the east side that, get, that were referred to as Torridonian, but now they tend to get referred to as having Torridonian affinities rather than being Torridonian per se. Um, they don't look like the Torridonian you get elsewhere. And it's famous for its marble, of course. The, the Iona marble is uh, world famous. This is the geological map of Iona. And it just looks almost as bad as the central mole map. It's really quite complicated. So I'm not going to dwell too much on that. But um, yeah, that's, that's Iona there. And these little red splodges here are actually the Ross of Mole granite. The Ross of Mole granite comes really close in. That's what that is there. Here's an aerial view of Iona. I can't remember where I nicked this picture from. There's the abbey down here. This is looking sort of south. You've got this fairly flat area here, which is these rocks that are sort of Torridonian. And then you've got the Lucian Nice making up most of the rest of it. On the ground, the really good places to visit, I reckon, are Columbus Bay, the Marble Quarry, the Macher, the East Coast, where some great erratic boulders sitting there. The Abbey, if you want to look at some of the actual building stones being used. There's a thing called the Ringing Stone, which doesn't get mentioned a lot, but I'll show you what it looks like. And some of the beaches at the north end, they're very nice. So this is Columbus Bay. Beautiful stones, fantastic place just to wander about looking at stuff. I reckon that Iona's got the most colourful pebbles of any, anywhere, in, certainly, in, certainly in Britain, I can think. I mean, they're really, really spectacular just because of the varieties of nice. I, sus I, mean, I suppose there's probably places in the Western Isles that are similar, but uh, yeah, the, the Iona beaches are, are really, really nice just to wonder about picking stuff up. What you'll find are 
some of the amongst some of these stones, there's there's two that seem to cause confusion. This stuff on the bottom here is the Iona marble and the precious serpentine. These greenish yellow stones that are used in jewelry and all sorts of things, highly prized. They're really nice. This greenish thing that you see at the top here is a mineral called epidote, which you'll find in the Lucian nice. Now it looks sort of green and shiny and nice when it's wet, but when it dries out, it's a sort of dull pistachio green color. It's not the same as this stuff. So don't get confused between the two. They're, they're quite different. When you see them side by side, they're quite obviously different, but you tend to find them close together. You know? This here is a boulder of Ross of Mull granite that is lying in Southeast Iona. And that heart shaped thing in the middle of it is what's called an enclave of diorite. The, the Ross of Mull granite has got a, a, a part of it is actually a much darker igneous rock called diorite. And it forms these sort of blobs and masses within the main granite mass. And that's what you've got here. And this one's sort of heart shaped, which I thought was quite cool. That's the marble quarry seen from above. Again, this is some picture nicked from Scran. Um, most of the machinery that you see here is still around and it's been preserved to try and you know, keep it from just disappearing. Um, it's an interesting location because there's lots of blocks of marble just kicking around. Here's a very old picture again from Scran showing some of the buildings and machinery. The, but the, the blocks, big white blocks of marble are just sitting there. Again, this is the this is the marble quarry, and we're looking sort of north to to the, the rocks that bound the edge of the quarry. And there's a, a dog that belonged to some friends of mine sitting on top of a particularly nice chunk of uh, marble, which we reckon would have made a good kitchen top if you could have got it out. So that's uh, that's the that's the marble. This is typically what the Lucian nice looks like, where you've got a nice fresh surface of it. It's, you know, it's beautiful greys and pinks and green colours running through it. So it's really, really quite an attractive rock. And here's a vein of epidote running through this uh, this nice, the, the, the banded rock is the, is the nice, and this green vein is the epidote mineral I was talking about. And you can see along here, there's a bit of displacement. There's a slight fault, small fault running through it. So it's been you know, aff affected at a later date. This is the macker. The, shell sand with the grass on it on the, the west side of Iona. And it's quite interesting because you've got this incredibly recent geological deposit, this sand which changes from year to year depending on the storms, and it's sitting on some of the oldest rocks in Britain. So there's, there's a real contrast in terms of the age. It's an interesting picture, this one. This isn't mine. It's, it was taken by George Washington Wilson, famous Victorian photographer who did a lot of photography around Scotland and the in well, Victorian times, and that's the spouting cave, the famous spouting cave in the southwest of Iona, having a good spout. So you obviously got it at the right moment there. It looks like Old Faithful. It's tremendous. Great picture of that. I mentioned the rocks on the east side of Iona. They, they, they get referred to as the Iona group, and they're, they look sort of Torridonian. Well, they're not really, but you've got these sandstones and siltstones and stuff like this. And as you can see, they're, you know, sort of, sort of run, they're sort of running vertically. The, the dip is vertical. There's a sort of honeycomb appearance to it because of the weathering. Um, so it's, it's very different from the nice on the, the west side. And sure enough, the east side of Iona is absolutely littered in erratic boulders. These are, this is a big boulder of Ross of Mull granite, which has come from over there. And the great thing about the, the Ross of Mull granite is you'll find big boulders of it west of the Ross of Mull you won't find boulders of the east of the Ross of Mall, which tells you about the direction of travel of the ice. It was from east to west. And uh, Iona's absolutely littered in erratic boulders like this. So there's lumps of the Ross of Mall granite everywhere brought by ice. I was talking about building stones. This is the inside of the abbey. And there's a whole variety of building stones here. Um, there's granite, Ross of Mall granite. There's some of that Torridonian looking stuff. There's, um, there's a lot of sandstone as well that's come from I'm not too sure where. And the altar, and you can see here in the back of the picture, the altar is made of the marble from the marble quarry. And it's really quite nice, well worth a look. I, I mentioned the ringing stone. Well, this is the ringing stone. It's on the east coast of Iona, about halfway from the slipway to the north end. And 
it's got a little hole in it there with a little boulder inside it, a little granite boulder. You can take that out and hit it, and it makes a ringing sound. It's got a real metallic sound to it, this stone. Again, it's a glacial erratic, but it's a glacial erratic of material that's not actually found in mull. It's a rock called cantalonite, and it's probably come from the Strontian complex, where there's quite a bit of this stuff. But it's not from mull. Well, well, I don't think cantalonite has been discovered in mull so far anyway. But uh, yeah, it makes a very distinctive metallic ringing sound when you hit it. It's quite an unusual thing. There's a similar stone in Tyree as well. There's a ringing stone there. I'm not sure if it's the same rock, but uh, it's quite unusual. And this is the north end of Iona. This beautiful, again, white sandy, shell sandy beaches looking over to Mull here. Um, and this rock that I said is of Torridonian affinity. A beautiful spot. Really nice just to wander and have a look at the, take in the scenery. And this is the view over to the Ross of Mull. That's the Ross of Mull granite we're seeing. This is Iona here. And we're looking across the Sound of Iona. Obviously quite a nice day today, but it can be, it can be pretty wild at times. So don't be deceived by it. If we move on to the Ross of Mull, it's famous for its granite quarries. The Ross of Mull granite is about 420 million years old. It's been dated. Uh, there are differences within the granite, and I showed you that earlier, that erratic that had that heart-shaped lump in it. Um, let's look at it in close-up, and we'll have a look at the quarry. And we'll have a wee look south of the pier, south of the slipway at uh, Finnefer, because there's some nice stuff going on there. So if we look at this simplified map again, here's the Ross of Mull granite down here. That's what we're going to have a, have a look at. This is the famous split boulder on the beach at Finnefer. And you can see it's a big boulder. Now, if you look at if you look at this carefully, you'll find there's holes in the top. It's been deliberately split. It didn't just happen. Um, it's quite a you know it's, it's quite an obvious feature on the shore, but it's been split by human activity. This is the stuff south of the a slipway that I was talking about. The pink stuff is the Ross of Mull granite, and this grey material is a type of rock called lamprophyre. And this has been intruded into the granite when the granite was still molten, but it's still not completely solidified. And what you'll find is there's small pieces of the pink granite in amongst the grey rock and vice versa. So the two have intermingled. And it's, uh, it's quite unusual, quite, it's, quite, uh, it's quite neat. And as I said, it's ju just south of the slipway. Very easy to find. There's Iona in the, in the background there. And if you look at the, the Ross of Mull granite in this sort of area, You'll notice it seems to have a sort of dip to the to the west, about 40 degrees. It's, it's, it's a definite trend that way. And the reason for that, they reckon, is it's because of the way that the, the granite was intruded. Instead of coming straight up and spreading out, a, it's come up the Sound of Iona Fault. There's a fault runs through the Sound of Iona. And they reckon that it's come up and spread out in a, in a sheet-like form. And that's what we're seeing here. So it's, and there's that grey stuff again, that, that grey material in amongst it. So, but the, but the, you know these these lines, these joints, these cooling cracks as you said, that are a, look like they're dipping down towards the the sound of Iona are really obvious. It's a very obvious feature. This is the the granite quarry at Tormor, just north of Finnefort. This is the probably one of the biggest quarries, and it's a steps down to it. And there's, I mean, there's huge quarried blocks just lying around. You can see big chunks of it. Now it's it's. The quarry still gets occasionally used. They don't they haven't been blasting or taking anything out that way, but there have been some blocks removed. There was a, a building project recently where they, they acquired a Ross of Mall granite. This is where it came from. This thing here that you're seeing in the in amongst the granite is what's called a xenolith. It's a small piece. Xenolith means foreign rock. And it's a bit of the when the granite gets intruded into wherever it gets intruded, it can pick up pieces of the, what's called the country rock round about, and these get uh, caught up in the granite. And that, that's what that thing is. That's a bit of moin schist or something round about. This is inside the quarry as well. And this, this black thing that you see in the middle is actually a dike, and we're looking at it edge on. There are several dikes. I'll, I'll mention dikes later. I'll go over dikes in a bit more detail later on. But... Um, this is the what you're looking at, it's a dike face on, uh, cutting through the quarry. 
And obviously, you know, you don't, you don't want too much of this stuff if you're trying to quarry rock. You, you know, you want the rock to be as pure as possible. But um, yeah, this is, this is one of the, the dikes that cut through it. If we move up, up the coast a bit, we've been to Finnefort, we're going to head on towards Bonesson. There's loads of geology to see here. I mean, it's, the Bonesson area is fantastic. I suppose that's why so many geology parties, field trips, uh, stay in that area. Skur House is very popular for geologists. Um, there's the beach at Ardalanish and Ushkin. And also at Skur, further along, Skur House, like I said, is a really popular venue. And Artun, famous for its leaf beds. And there's great views over to Armenia to the north. So there's, there's loads to see in Bonesson. Um, so we'll just have a look at some of these. Again, this is the map. Bonesson is here. You've got some of the older metamorphic rocks down here, which we'll be looking at in just a minute. And there's our tun there. This is our Mianuk over here. So we'll see all these places. This is our Dalanish, typical metamorphic rock country. You've got beautiful folding in the rocks like this. These are old sediments that have been metamorphosed. Really quite nice. If you move on a bit from our Dalinish, you come to this type of thing. This is the contact of the granite with the metamorphic rocks. Now, when you look at a geological map, you get this nice line between the two rock types, and it's as if one ends, suddenly another begins. It's not quite like that in practice. There's always a bit of intermingling with these things. And the contact of the Ross of Mull granite, which is the pink stuff, with the Moyne rocks, which is the grey stuff, is this is, a, this is a classic locality, this because the, the granite has eaten into the, the metamorphic rocks, but the metamorphic rocks haven't really moved much out of position. They're still basically lying horizontal here. Um, so the, the emplacement of the granite into this stuff wasn't particularly violent. It was fairly passive. It was fairly gentle. And it's, it's a process called stoping, where it, it sort of plucks away and it eats away at the surrounding rocks. And just to add to the complication, you know, there's, a, there's a dike running through here, there's a, a sort of sheet of rock running through the, the whole thing as well. So this is, a, this, is a, this is a classic locality. Geologists come from all over to look at this stuff. Again, here's the same sort of stuff. You've got the, you've got the granite, which is the pink stuff, and you've got the metamorphic rock, this grey material. And um, like I said, you, you, you go from one to the other, and it's a gradual process. If you were to go further east, you would find no granite. If you went further west, you would find 100% granite. And in the middle, there's this zone of mixing, which we've got here. So that's, uh, that's the contact of the, the Moyne rocks with the granite. And it's a world famous location, Ardalanish. This is the beach at Ushkin. Ushkin's a lovely spot. Um, uh, the, the rocks are um, similar to Ardalanish. But um, one of the things that you'll find here that's really quite neat is this. You've got these huge garnets. The, there's, a, there's a rock called amphibolite, which is a, metamorph which is a metamorphosed igneous rock. And as a part of the process of heat and pressure change within the rock, it's produced these large garnets. Now, unfortunately, they're not of gem quality, or else it'd be quite a, quite a thing. They're, um, they're pretty impure and they're full of inclusions. But they're huge. I mean, some are about two centimeters across. So it's worth going there and see if you can spot this stuff. There's plenty of it lying around. That's at Ushkin. If you go further along the coast from Ushkin, you come to the, you get this very distinctive scenery where you've got these peninsulas stretching out. This, this, is, this, is, um, this is near Skur. And the, I think it's because of, the, because of the metamorphic rocks, the way they're folded, the way they're dipping, the way they're oriented. It's given rise to this type of a coastline where it's indented with these peninsulas. Beautiful part of the world. This is looking back at that, over, at that last scene. And you can see the schists are nearly, well, they're not quite vertical, but not far off it. So they've been, you know, they've, they've experienced quite a bit of movement, these rocks. They'd folded and contorted and generally moved around. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's near Skur. If we nip across to the other side of the peninsula, go to Artun. It's famous for its leaf beds. It was the uh, Duke of Argyll who discovered these way back in the 19th century. You've got tertiary basalt lavas there that are quite spectacular. There's great columns. I love columns. Columnar basalt is one of these things I just love, cannot get enough of. You'll see plenty of it tonight. 
and there's great views to the north. This is our view to the north. This is our Mianach that we're looking at over here. The, a, the, you can see the lavas that, are, that form this very, very distinct terracing, what they call trap featuring, where they're sort of horizontal and um, really quite, uh, you know, really distinctive. This is the gully that leads down to the famous leaf beds at our tun. And this is the sort of rough area where you find them. It's all quite steep. The rocks here are a mixture of conglomerates of, uh, gathered in amongst the, up amongst the volcanics and uh, volcanic lava as well. This is looking down on the shore. And again, nice, good columns, good volcanic columns. And there's this amazing sea stack that seems to, it looks like a fist coming out of the sea. Uh, it's quite impressive. And when you look at it side on, you see it's a slightly different shape. This is the same thing, but we're looking at it from the side. And you continue looking at the, this bit of coast. There's a big cave here. And again, lots of columns. The, the columnar basalt. It's the same, it's the same stuff as you get in Staffa. It's, a, it's, a, it's the same formation, which I'll be talking about in a future talk. Um, but uh, yep, that's what that is here. And this is it in close up, just a slightly abstract picture, just giving you an impression of the shape of these things. They're not all regular six sided. Some of them are got five, sometimes seven. Um, but yeah, columnar basalt, good stuff. So we'll go back to the map that we've been to our turn. We're heading up Loch Screedon now. So we're going to go to Karsig. Karsig is one of the best geological sites, but there is so much to see in Karsig. You, you could do a whole talk on Karsig. It's one of these classic localities where there's just, there's just so much to see um, in a short in a, in a small area huge variety there's unusual minerals you'll find sapphire there if you know where to look great coastal scenery as well the cliffs are spectacular as we head up this is looking across to our again again you can see the the very distinctive layering in the lavas and this is the coast at Karsing. this is the cliffs so again you've got these basalt lavas on top and underneath near the bottom of the cliffs, you've got some of the underlying sedimentary rocks, stuff that's Jurassic and Cretaceous in age. You've got nice big ammonite cast. I haven't managed to find any nice ammonites myself, but this is where an ammonite has been. That's a big, that's a big one, that. Uh, there's quite a few of these to be found, just the impressions left by the ammonites. And there's other fossils as well. There's a lot of these fossil oysters. There's a thing called Gryphea that you get a lot of in Karsig. So there's, there's just, it's very fossiliferous. One of the things about Mull and about and, and the Karsig, you see it really well, are dikes. Now I mentioned dikes earlier. I just want to say a little bit about it before we go any further. Dikes are basically splits in the earth's crust where the molten material has come up. And some of these go for quite some distance, as you can see on this map here. And Mull is a particularly good place for seeing dikes. A quick wee diagram here. This shows you what igneous intrusions look like. You've got a thing called a basolith if it's big, with the material coming up and pouring at the top as a volcano. Where you've got these vertical things running up, those are called dikes. And here's a good example of one here. That's a dike. That thing there is a dike. So it's just a split that the molten material has come up and solidified. Here's a dike at Karsig with a split bit going off to the right, the left as well. So it's it's actually split in two. So there's some, some quite spectacular dikes in Mull. And uh, Karsig is as good a place as any to see them. If we go east of the pier at Karsig, you come to things like this sea stack. And that's the Lagan Peninsula that you can see in the distance. If you, keep, if you were to keep going around here, you'd come to Loch Dewey. Um, that sea stack's quite interesting. It's columnar. It's got a cave in it. And the cave has got a window. That thing there is a window. So if you were to sit inside, you can look out through the window, right through the door. How cool is that? I mean, that ticks a lot of boxes. It's a sea stack, it's columnar, it's a cave, and it's got a window. It's even got a seat in it, so you can sit there. Brilliant place to have lunch. Again, the columnar basalt in, the, in this part of Karsig is really spectacular. It's sort of like organ pipes, you're looking up into them. And just along the coast from there, there's a waterfall. And you can actually stand, stand behind it and look out in a wee cave. That lady there was one of my clients on a walk last year. She's actually standing behind the waterfall. 
the scenery was just spectacular. Never tire of it. So we've been to Karsig and we're moving on. We're going to go back the way a little bit because we're going to have a look at the famous Karsig arches. Now the Karsig arches aren't actually at Karsig itself. They're a bit further along the coast to the west. To get, get, to get to them, you can, well, there's different ways of getting to them, but I quite like going this way. This is a thing called Gorry's Leap, this point of rock. Uh, it's a tremendous coastal scenery here. And these are the cliffs, and you can see there are things called sills cutting across. Uh, that's what these things are here. Um, tremendous cliffs, again, it's that columnar rock. Quite spectacular. The sea is a beautiful colour here. The only problem with this here is this bay here attracts all sorts of uh, marine rubbish. There's an incredible amount of plastic and stuff builds up in here, which is a shame because it's such a beautiful area. So if you go along here to this point here, you'll find the Karsig arches, which look like this. And again, lots of columnar rock. One of the arches is like a sea stack with a keyhole-shaped hole in the middle of it. The other one is really just a big cave that goes right through. Uh, you know, it's a fair effort to get to them but uh, they're well worth seeing. They really are spectacular. But as I said, they're not actually near Karsig, they're further west. And there's all sorts of nice amygdales in the rock filled with crystals, this sort of stuff. Uh, the quartz and calcite and all these minerals. And there's a picture of sapphire from Karsig. Now don't be fooled, that's about a millimeter across. So it's, um, but you do get that in some of the rocks near there. Back to this map again, we've got the Karsig. We're going to start heading up through this bit here. We're going to head to Craig Muir. And this is this really complicated bit of geology that we see in the middle. The map looks impressive. It was thoroughly researched over 100 years ago. Um, and as I said, the map makers did a good job of it. We'll take a quick trip through Glenmore and just look at a couple of things in there that we'll, we can see. As you go through Glenmore, you get this lovely big gabbro boulder near a quarry. And that's Ben Moore and the Keir, these mountains here covered in snow. Great spot, lovely view. That's the highest peak in Mull, and it's Monroe, of course. Uh, if you move up the glen, you get to Loch Scorpion with its Cranog, that's an artificial island. And in the hills up here, you get what are called pillow lavas. And this is pillow lava, these rounded sort of lumps. What's happened is the lava has been extruded into water and it forms pillows, quite deep water. So that's what's been going on here. Um, the, the survey officers discovered this and came to the conclusion there must have been a caldera, a water-filled crater in the volcano. And that's what we're seeing here as a consequence of that. So if we move up through Glenmore, out onto the main road, up towards Craigmuir, you get this thing at the side of the road, which is a volcanic plug. It's basically the, the stump of a conduit that molten material would have come up. So this would have gone much higher up. All we're doing, look, doing now is looking at the base of it. We'll see another couple of these in just a short while, further north. So we're about, yeah, that's it there in fact, that thing. We're just about to head up this side of the island. The second part of the journey. So Craig, you're up to Salon, then up to Tobermory, and then over to the west side again. There has to be said there isn't quite so much of geological interest on the east side of the island, I think. The west is definitely best, but then everybody says that anyway, no matter what you're talking about. Um, but um, no, the, the east side isn't quite as spectacular as the west. We get to Tobermory, and here's a, a famous spot, the lighthouse at Ruanangal. Great walk just north of Tobermory, beautiful uh, place to go for a stroll. It's Arda Merkin in the background. If you go a bit further north of the, the lighthouse at Ruanangal, you'll find these. These are the underlying sedimentary rocks that the lava has poured out over the top of. These are like, they're, they're really horrible. They're sort of very, very hard uh, sort of limestones and sandstones and stuff. Um, but uh, very distinctive, very, very different from what lies on top of it. A little bit further north, if you care to explore, is this thing. Now this is a quarry, it's a sandstone that's in there. It's not just a quarry, it's also a fossil hill because this thing that you're seeing here, this pointed bit, is actually the shape of the landscape. And what's, what you see covered in vegetation is actually basalt lava either side which has poured over the top of this thing. 
So this sandstone was quarried to make the approach to the lighthouse, the lighthouse that we saw earlier. That's, 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 it wasn't used to make the lighthouse itself, but to, to make the approach to the lighthouse. So you can actually see the sandstone in the lighthouse approach without going to this quarry itself. It's a nice red sandstone, Jurassic in age. Uh, a little bit further north from here, you've got this thing. This, this is a dike. I mentioned dikes earlier. This is one seeing edge on. And that, that's seeing it from the side. It's like a wall of rock. It's really distinctive. Quite an interesting feature. I mean, but there's, there's lots of dikes in this area. But this, is one, this one stands out really well. If we go back towards the lighthouse, you've got the lighthouse cottages here. Now, there's an interesting little feature here. Uh, this was pointed out to me by one of the guys that works on the, the ferry. I said, that white thing that you see running up the hillside here is a lichen-covered dike. And he pointed out that from certain angles, like this, it looks like smoke coming out the chimney of the house. So you often find these dikes are covered in lichen. It makes them stand out. It's a whitish appearance. So that's at the lighthouse. Well worth a walk. Definitely, definitely a good place to go for a visit. A bit further over, I mentioned volcanic plugs earlier on. There's, there's one on the way out to Glengorm. There's a hill called Crocker Crocker, which means the hangman's hill. So presumably it was used for executions in the past. Um, this, this is how it looked like in the setting sun. There was nothing, I, I, didn't, I didn't alter this picture or anything. That's just the way it happens to look. This incredible pink color when the, the sun was going down. Um, but this is a volcanic plug. Like I said, it's a stump or the remains of a conduit that magma would have traveled up and poured out on the surface. This is just the worn down remains of it. There's another one further over, just not far from here, that we called Sargebin. Now, Sargebin is one of the, the great points in North Mull for going for a walk and getting a good view. It's a little rocky hill just west of Tobermory and away out to Dervig. This is what it looks like from the south. Again, a volcanic plug. And it's got a nice loch in the top of it. Lovely spot. It's, uh, again, it's, it's a worn down stump of a magmatic conduit. The next stop is going to be Calgary Bay. We're moving steadily westwards. It's a popular Macher beach. There's a lot of geological interest there. It's actually really accessible. Um, then we'll go to Laganolva and Alva before heading on. So this is what Calgary looks like. That's the beautiful sand, white shell sand. This nice turquoise azure color in the, the sea. There's another view from the south. Again, the lavas up here, you can see the trap beach in some very level, sort of flat layering in the lavas. A lot of people on the beach there. And if you look out towards the, the, the west, you can see this, this sort of platform in the rocks here. There's a very distinct terrace. This is the ancient pre-glacial shoreline that we're seeing here, um, which goes back 30,000 years, I reckon. Um, not, not to the most recent glacial period, but to well before that. And it's, it's just a flat lying terrace all the way around, makes very easy walking. You can see it there, which is quite, quite distinctive. Again, dikes, loads of dikes at Calgary. Here's a nice one going uh, northwest, southeast, like most of these dikes do. And here's the famous one, of course, the one at the pier. It's been used to make part of this building. It runs down the hill, and very, very distinctive feature. But it's sort of, it's sort of, I mean, you can trace it up the hill a bit, but it just seems to disappear. It's, it stands out well in the, in the cliff face, but uh, Further up, it's not quite so easy to find. If we go to the pier, we'll see it's made of Ross of Mull granite. So if you want to see what the Ross of Mull granite looks like, you don't have to go to the Ross of Mull, you can find it at Calgary. That's what this is. And here's a view from up above looking down onto Calgary, just uh, from the hill above the, to the north of the bay. Uh, it's a great viewpoint down onto there. And this is the south side of the, the area around about uh, Treshnish. Again, you, this is this, I don't know where I nicked this picture from, but that shows you this, this pre glacial shoreline. It's like a very flat terrace all the way around there. And it's really, really easy walking around this stuff. Very, very straightforward. So it's a nice, nice to explore that on a good day. So that's just that's south of Calgary. I think that you'll find in a lot of the rocks round about Mull, especially in the north and west, is this red material. And uh, it's, 
it's basically the weathered surface of a lava flow, where the, when the, the lava has been subjected to weathering in a fairly dry, arid climate, it breaks down, the iron-rich components break down, giving this red material. And you'll see, you'll see, you'll see it in lots of places. It's, it's, it's quite common. So we've come round here, Calgary, and we're heading down this side of the island now. We're down about Laganolva, where there's this very distinctive volcanic ash. And it's cut by dikes. And you can see that the effect of the dikes cutting this is to metamorphose the, metamorphose the, the ash. It's turned into this red color. Uh, really distinctive, it's like a bright stripe on the rocks. And this is this is at Laganolva. It's very very accessible, very easy to get to. It's not far from the road. Nearby, you've got this famous waterfall, the Ace Force, which is um, drops into the sea. Uh, a couple of people up there for scale. That was at uh, oh, it was about twenty years ago. I took this picture. This is what it looked like a few weeks ago. It's quite impressive. There was a fair amount of water coming over there. It's one of the, the great coastal features of Mull that everybody should go and see. The Ace Force is great. So we'll head off to Alva and Staffa since we're in the area. This is the, the famous basalt columns in Alva. Very distinctive. Looks similar to what you get in Staffa. That's them up close. So it's basically the same, same rock as Staffa. And it forms nice steps, very easy to walk on. Very distinctive columnar basalt. This is a view from the east looking west. So along the south side of Alva, you've got this stuff. It's quite uh, quite impressive. And here's Staffa, of course, further west. And the Staffa with its distinctive columns. Now, I'm going to be talking about this stuff uh, in depth. And the next talk is going to be looking at the Staffa lava formation. I've already given a talk on this, so I'm going to do it again. Um, and we'll be talking about why columns form and how they, where you find it and what's so special about it. And this is uh, this is staff up when I was I was there a couple of years ago. Um, the columns are really impressive, really impressive cliffs. The sea was quite wild that day as well as you can see. Um, and that island in the background there, that's it gets called the Dutchman's Cap. It's got a very distinctive shape. And this is the entrance to Fingal's Cave. Again, a, quite a foamy sea and these nice columns. So if, you, if, never, if you've never been to Staff, I thoroughly recommend it. It's definitely a place to go. Not far from Alva Ferry, there's a place called Ars Jerich, which is this point with these, again, you've got this columnar basalt. And this is the same stuff, exactly the same stuff as you get in Alva by the looks of things. Um, that's the island of Eorsa here. And that's Ben Moore. We're seeing it from the other side this time, the highest point in Mull. So that's just, it's quite, quite nice views from here. And again, the, the columnar basalt is basically the same as we've seen before. So we're on the last leg of the journey. This is the, the sort of final bit of our trip around Mull. And we're, we're getting to the really interesting stuff now. We'll go up Loch Ba, have a look at the Loch Ba ring dike, and then we'll head on down Loch Nakiel over to Grieven and the wilderness and then we'll go back to Kinloch and sort of not, not where we started but just up the road from it. So we've been to Staffa, there's Alva, that's Loch Nakiel. We're going to have a look at the Loch Bar Ring Dyke which is here Then we're going to go down the shore here along the coast and round this bit here to here which is Kinloch. So the Loch Bar Ring Dyke has been described as the most perfect example of a ring dyke known to science. Now, I'm not sure how scientific it is to describe something as being most perfect. I, I didn't think they could have degrees of perfection, but anyway, that's how they described it in the memoir. We're so awestruck by it. And this is what it looks like in profile from Loch Bar. It's this prominent ridge that goes up the hillside. Now, if you look at it on the map, uh, the map in the, in the in the memoir of the, the survey, they've got it going all the way around in a ring. Now, it's it really, you know, the, the only bit where it looks very, very distinctive is this section here. 
which I've got in the pictures that are coming up. The rest of it is actually quite hard to find. It's not that obvious. On this side of the loch, coming down here, it's not too bad. You can see quite a bit of it. But, um, you know, it's the idea of it standing up like a, a wall of rock all the way around is definitely not the case. It's, uh, you know, it is impressive, but, you know, it's, um, it's quite subtle. It's quite tricky to find in places. This is what it looks like at the top, looking down. Like I said, it's like a wall of rock, you know, going down the hillside. That's Loch Ba down here. And it's this very distinctive light colour. If you look at it in close up, you'll find that it's got the lighter coloured rock is granitic in composition. And these dark bits are basaltic, if you like. So you've got two completely different types of magma, which have incompletely mixed. So you've got these little twists and swirls of the, the darker um, basaltic material in amongst this granitic material. So there's been two magma types available at the one time, and there's been incomplete mixing of the two. That's, and it's quite unusual. I mean, the, the Loch Bar Ring Dyke is a, a really good example of a ring dyke anyway, and it's made even more unusual by this mixed magma going on here. In fact, you've got these two completely different rock types mixed together. Um, makes it quite interesting. It's been well studied. As, as well as the, the ring dike, which is what this white material here is, you've also got some late dikes, some late conventional mull dikes cutting across it. That's what this thing is here, it's filled with feather. Um, so although the ring dike, the lock bar ring dike, was one of the, the last igneous events in mull, um, it's actually crossed by some other later dikes as well. And these, these, these really stand out, some of these. One in particular looks like this. It's actually a chasm. It's completely weathered out to form this steep-sided chasm cut across the dike. So this is the ring dike running down here. And you've got this chasm cutting across it, which is a, a weathered out dike. And this was a filthy wet day, I remember. But um, yeah, you can walk through here and you can actually see the dike material in the bottom of it. So that was, um, yeah, that's the, the Loch Bar ring dike. I'll be doing a talk about that uh, later, uh, sometime end of towards the end of August or uh, October rather. So we're going to head on down Loch Nakiel towards Greben. Look at some glacial features, more dikes, conglomerates, fine cliff scenery. This is the the the, the famous P forms, as they're called, plastic forms. These they're like gouges. They're like channels in the rock caused by glaciation. And it's, um, I'm not sure if they're totally understood, but that it's probably due to the hydraulic action of the, the water underneath the glacier gouging this lot out. And uh, the pea forms that you find down at, uh, down towards uh, Loch Nakiel are amongst the best in Britain, apparently. Very obvious when you see them in the rock, these channels, quite distinctive. And in the same area, there's a dike cutting across. There's, there's lots of dikes in this area, but here's one here. It doesn't stand up and it isn't weathered out. It's exactly the same level as the rock itself. It's just like this stripe going across the, the rock into the sea. It's quite a nice one. This is the Greben coast, very distinctive with its cliffs, really dramatic bit of coastline, this, the basalt lavas towering above the, the road. And uh, we, we tend to think of geology as being a sort of slow, inexorable process. But every so often, something dramatic happens. This isn't just a boulder, it's a gravestone. There's, there's people under that. That was the, this is the famous tragedy boulder, Clachnolan, I think it's called, at uh, Greben. And what happened, it was in early 18th century, I think, 1700 and something. There was a newly married couple in their house and this boulder crashed down on top of it. And that's the remains of it there. So like I said, that's not just a boulder, it's a gravestone. Quite a dramatic, you know, sort of sobering sort of thought as you go by that. Um, and there's still stones coming down off the, the cliffs there regularly. So that's, that's, that's called the tragedy boulder at Greben. This is the, another view of the cliffs at Greben. Again, you can see the, the lava layers very distinct, very distinctive scenery in this, this area. If you go down to the shore at Greben, 
you'll find these distinctive sort of polygonal cracks, these things in the in the in the sediments here. These are these, the sediments here are mainly Triassic in age. These are um, desiccation cracks. What you find is that the sediment has dried out. You know how mud, when it dries out, can form these sort of hexagon-shaped cracks and things. What's happened is these have been filled in with some sort of sediment, covered over, and that's been preserved um, as it's solidified. And now we're seeing it sort of weathering out, and you've got these you know, distinctive features. You know, they're quite obvious when you see them. Um, that thing in the background here is a bit of landslip. That's what that is, that, that little hill of stuff that's come down from the slopes above. And again, you've got the, the basalt lava cliffs here. That's the desiccation cracks seen uh, in close up. <coughs> Grieben is also famous for its unconformity. And unconformity is where there's a major uh, gap in time between the rocks. So what you've got, I mean, the, the most famous unconformity is probably Hutton's unconformity at Sicker Point in Berwickshire. But this one is quite a good one as well. What you've got are these Moyne rocks, which are quite old, dipping about 40 degrees underneath. And on top of them, you've got these horizontal layers of uh, Triassic conglomerates. So there's, you know, there's a major gap in terms of uh, time between these two. Here's a picture showing you the, the various things. You've got the Moyne Samites, these things underneath and the metamorphic rocks. Then you've got the Triassic conglomerates lying on top. And then you've got the Paleogene, the tertiary basalts, lavas and things on top of this. So at, uh, you know, at Grieben, it's, it's one of these places where you can see the, the three main layers of rock that make up Mull. You've got the really old stuff, the middle aged stuff, and the, the lavas that are much more recent. Um, all in the one picture. <coughs> so we're, we're down about here, okay. And the last bit of the journey, we've got McKinnon's Cave, the Wilderness and the Fossil Tree and back to Kinloch. So these are the, the basalts above uh, McKinnon's, where McKinnon's Cave is. You've got sort of sills cutting through here, that's what that thing is. Um, this is the shore towards McKinnon's Cave. It's quite rugged, really wild country this we're going into now. This is probably some of the wildest country in Mull, to be honest. It is really dramatic coastal scenery. Um, you can see the, the metamorphic rocks, these samites dipping like this as you approach the cave. And I've got this distinctive jointing pattern. It's almost like triangles and hexagons. Uh, it's, uh, over, uh, it's just a way they've changed through time, through the metamorphic processes. If we keep going on, you've got this really nice sea stack. And that's it seen from above. And there it is again, seen through a natural arch. There's some, some great coastal scenery around here. This is a place they call the wilderness. If you keep going on, you've got these dramatic caves and these inlets like this. Very, very broken country. And there's another inlet there. And yes, the path does go as close to the edge as you're seeing there. It's quite, quite, um, it's quite dramatic. These great splits in the rock. As you go a bit further around, it gets a little bit more gentle, not quite so dramatic. Uh, you've got some, again, nice little pinnacles of rock with caves in them, lots of this sort of stuff. And here's some of the inhabitants, some of the, the wild goats you get in this area. You see, you see them regularly. And sure enough, not far until we get some columnar basalt again. As we move further around, we start to see the, the, the basalt lavas that are over the top. Some nice crystal lined cavities. It looks like quartz that's in there. There's another one with a coin for scale. Um, this sort of nose, if you like, that's the very end of the, the very point of, the, of that peninsula as we, we move around. Okay, you can see the layering in the lavas. And more columns. There's the Dutchman's cap again. Hey, that's Staffa, it's long over there. There's more columns for you. I just, oh, it's just, there's columnar basalt everywhere. There's a dike cutting across 
and there's a cave. We're getting on towards the fossil tree here. Uh, this area is called Ruanahua, which means the point of the cave. And there's certainly there's lots of caves in the area. That's the famous fossil tree cast. There's a bit of the fossil tree at the bottom, but up, up above here, it's just the, the, the cast of where it's been. It's a famous location, McCulloch's tree, it gets called after McCulloch who first described it. <coughs> On the shore, not far from the fossil tree, you'll find this thing, which is like a, like a daisy head. On the shore, look it up close. It's got this radial pattern of columns. And um, they reckon that this is the cast of a tree as well. There's been a tree growing up out of this. And this basalt lava has solidified round about it, leaving this central hole where the tree would have been. It's quite remarkable. A really, really odd looking feature. If we move further around, you start to get sick. There's the Dutchman's cap again. We're gradually heading back to where we, be, where we started. Really, the clouds are quite impressive there. This is the map. So we're about here. And we're back looking at Benmore and the Kirch. We're at the head of the loch. And that is it. Thank you. If anyone wants to get a hold of me, these are some contact methods. <laughs>